This video is sponsored by Trade Coffee. Trade makes it easy to find new coffees that you will love without having to be a coffee pro. I'm definitely not a coffee expert, so it's perfect for me. Here's how it works. First, you take the quiz on the Trade website about your tastes and how you like your coffee. Trade will curate coffee matches just for you, and it will get delivered to your door with the frequency that you choose. After you try your coffee, be sure to rate it so that you can continue to get coffee that's best suited to your taste. It gets better. All of the packaging is compostable, and the coffee that you receive is roasted and shipped to you within 24 hours of of your order. Trade guarantees you'll love your first bag of coffee, but if you don't, they'll mail you another one for free. Speaking of free, since fans get their first bag free when they sign up, plus free shipping. Just take the quiz by clicking the link in the description. closest this army of soldiers and a helicopter gets to shooting Bond is his f***ing ski. Trust me guys, this isn't one of the good ones, so you'll be doing us all a favor if you finish off Bond before the opening musical number. And out of f***ing nowhere, California Girls by the Beach Boys starts playing and robs what minuscule amount of tension this bullsh** snow scene had managed to build. As far as jarring moments in cinema go, this is right up there with Tobey Maguire's emo Spider-Man and Arnie putting on those f***ing star-shaped sunglasses in Terminator 3. Being a helicopter in a Bond film is like being the Titanic in, well, you know. I can only assume this wasn't one of the top secret missions. Maybe a medium secret mission, where keeping your country's identity a secret isn't necessary? These motherfuckers just gave up? They pursued Bond all the way down to the water and then just accepted his vanishing into thin air, as opposed to questioning the clearly artificial iceberg moving at a significantly faster pace than its icy brethren? I'm gonna send the individual that A agreed to Bond's request for this totally unnecessary throttle lever, and B believed him when he said he would only use it in case of emergency. The creative team behind this intro definitely ran out of inspiration, so they just waited for Sir Roger Moore to fall asleep after one of his infamous shroom binges and took note of everything he said during the inevitable fever dream that followed. Neon snowflakes! Lasers! Fire lady! Ski lady! Melty ice lady! Shadows! The shadows are skiing, father! Tassels! Also, I won't have a reason to take many sins off for this movie, so might as well remove one for this very fun Duran Duran song. Easily the best thing about this movie. It's very nice money, Penny. Don't you think it's a little over the top for the office? I've been trying to reach you all morning. That's an odd way of saying f*** you, I'll dress how I want. Well now, until recently, all microchips were susceptible to damage from the intense magnetic pulse of a nuclear explosion. Yes, this is all very fascinating, but why is nobody paying attention to this good boy and his wobbly antenna? Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? Precisely why I've already initiated an investigation. All right, but for heaven's sake, let's be discreet about it. <laughs> Oh yeah, real discreet. Speaks at least five languages, no accent. And someone cast Christopher Walken to play this dude? The man is an accent. Who's that with him under the hat? Whoever she is, she's dressed like she's just been exiled from the Q Continuum. I'm pleased you approve, since you're paying the bill. Bonsoir, mon cher. Whatever the f*** this is. How does no one else see this person? At the very least, they should be able to see the long fishing pole. Perhaps we should add this butterfly to our collection. No. I see this movie's way of making Bond seem less sexist and cringy is to up the cringe factor for every male he interacts with. <coughs> Was there really not an easier way for May Day to kill Aubergine? She has to take out the other butterfly wrangler without anyone noticing, make sure she doesn't stab anyone else before she gets to discount Poirot, and then make an escape without anyone seeing her. What happened to shooting a gun from a dark corner? I like fun over the top Bond as much as anyone else, but the classic shtick works as well sometimes. Oh, there's a fly in his suit. Are you seriously quipping after this man has just been murdered right in front of you? <laughs> Yes, dear audience, what you just witnessed was the incomparable James Bond licensed to kill the greatest spy in history, bested by a fishing rod and tackle. Great escape plan, surely no one will notice the woman with the giant yellow parachute. Also, this parachute wasn't on May Day's back five seconds ago. I know this was Roger Moore's final outing as Bond, but is it not customary to wait till the end of the movie to recast the character? Follow the parachute! Bond isn't even giving this taxi driver a chance to process his instructions, so why did he ask him to follow the parachute in the first place? Oh my God! Ah! This is how we depict the French in film, and we want why they hate us. Also, this man clearly has a French accent, so why isn't he shouting Mon Voiture? What are these boating quads even doing here? There has to be a better scenario to unload your cargo than the middle of a busy street. Also, I'm calling bullshit on any of these fools being able to get out of the way. Bond just murdered every one of these asshats. To be fair, they're blocking traffic and they don't have to be. Ergo, they deserve the murder and I hope they go to hell for what they've done. Sure was nice of this bus to be the perfect distance from the boat patrol for Bond to land his car safely. The traffic laws in Paris really do keep all the stunt driver's needs in mind. What the f*** do the French make their barriers out of? Adamantium? Jesus, it's like this car was built with those perforated lines that help you tear paper. What the f*** France?
literally crashing a wedding. So? As in, so why are you the one driving the boat when you have an entourage of lackeys who could do it for you? If Mayday does get caught here with Zorn driving the boat, he's pretty f no? It's not like just because you're mega rich you can get away with everything. Wait. What did you learn from Aubergine before his untimely demise? Well, only that Zarin is having a thoroughbred sale at his stud not far from here. So, in short, the only thing Bond learned from Monsieur Eggplant was the location of a horse auction? A fact that I am positive Sir Godfrey here, being of the same social circle, would almost certainly have known about. Six million francs well spent! Tell me, the Ithacus Colt, is it here? You mean the full brother of Pegasus? Are there multiple horses being auctioned off named Ithacus? Not only is Scarpine answering a question with a question, but it's a pointless and dumb question at that. Welcome, sir. I'm Jenny Flex. Of course you are. I get it, it's a Bond film, so we do need sexual innuendo names. But Flex is a stretch. Although, at least you didn't try out something with the actress's actual last name of Duty. I take it you spend quite a lot of time in the saddle. Yes, I love an early morning ride. No, I'm an early riser myself. Equine inspired innuendos? Equine endos? I suppose they're going to assume that there was just the one listening device in the room and call this a job well done. Another wealthy owner? Who knows? Should certainly bear closer inspection. My god, this movie has 95% sexual innuendo, 4% Roger Moore eye f***ing anything with a pulse, and 1% actual story. And I think I hate that final 1% the most! If this room was so top secret that Bond got the stink eye earlier from Mayday when he looked through the window, then why is that door unlocked? What about fishing? Fly casting? Why even bother with the Sinjin Smythe bullshit if you essentially blow your cover with this cheap shot? Hello. I thought you might like to join the party. The age difference between Roger Moore and Tanya Roberts is 22 years, but what puts this in even creepier context is that Roger Moore was also older than Tanya Roberts' mom. I'm sure I've seen him somewhere before. What? How the f*** do you not remember the face of a man that you almost killed with a fishing rod on the Eiffel Tower? How often does that happen to you that it isn't immediately emblazoned onto your mind? Earlier we were told that Sir Godfrey is with the department, but surely he's not an actual spy, right? So why is he snooping around as if he's double OAP? Quite a letdown. My four-word review of this film somehow makes it into the script. Seeing Bond in what amounts to a tracksuit is like seeing Vision in a sweater. It's unnerving as hell. St. John's Mouth, speaking like a baby. We can see monitors in this room, so clearly they have some cameras. So how do they not have the cameras in all the places Bond chooses to go? And those seem like the places they really need cameras. Does Mayday's attire look like the most comfortable thing for this kind of activity? I'm sorry. What was I saying? I seem to have asked for that. I mean fallen behind. I mean butt cheeks mulligan. This hookup makes absolutely zero sense for anybody. Mayday and Bond have shown zero attraction to each other, and neither one ends up using this encounter to gain any information from the other. Damn it, Bond. You're at work. This is your job. According to the computer, we have several horses that might interest you. Splendid. There is zero reason for Zoran to run this background search on Bond while he is literally across the desk from him. Just use your pervy mirror camera and take a snap and do your snooping after he's left. I'm confused as to why 007 is actually spelled out as 007 here. It makes sense to say it that way because it's quicker, but writing it out like this is totally pointless. And don't get me started on the fact that he should actually be called 007. Throwing yourself this deep undercover is admirable, but there has to be something more valuable Tibbet could be doing other than buffing Bond's British bonnet. Also, come to think of it, what use is being undercover if they didn't bother to change his goddamn name? If Zorn has the ability to make Bond's horse go out of control, why has he waited until now to push this f***ing button? Instead of rearranging the obstacle course to cheat the race, he should have pushed this button as soon as it started. Or, you know, just shoot him in the office or somewhere else once he found out he was James Bond and had the drop on him. Driving Tibbet's corpse. Killing Tibbet was a mistake. I'm about to make the same mistake twice. You're going to kill Tibbet again? That seems like, well, overkill. I have neither the will nor inclination to attempt this, but I refuse to believe that you would be able to create enough of a seal between your lips and the valve to prevent you from inhaling a gallon of water per breath. Discount Dolph Lundgren. Holy sh! What is it with this ridiculously low table? Zorn is a dick to these men's spines. There is one obstacle. As my Uncle Tommy used to always say, why press a button when a jar of microchips will do the job? What have you to kill? I beg you, please roll credits before my eyes roll out of my skull. Wait, have we missed a scene? How the f did Bond know Zorn was going to San Francisco? Looking for something special? Yes. Soft show crabs. Might have some in the back. Isn't a secret code supposed to be something unique? Isn't soft shell crab a fairly common request at a seafood stand? I feel like the CIA agent would have accidentally blown his cover on the first damn day to the first tourist with a shellfish craving. Also, did the CIA buy out this entire seafood stand? What if Bond had asked one of these other guys? I suppose he would have just left with a tasty snack. It wasn't this Morton or Glove tried by the War Crimes Commission. The Russians grabbed him, set him up in a laboratory. Man, James Bond movies really like to oversell all this science fiction. It's not like actual Nazis were ever taken in by other countries after World War II and allowed to achieve great status and success in their fields of study. That never happened, right? Right? 
That Zorin oil pumping station ruined one of the best crab patches in the bay. Scared them away? No, they didn't go nowhere. They just disappeared. How does he know the crabs didn't go anywhere if they disappeared? Zorin, Mayday, and Scarpine are all here at the pumping station in San Francisco when Bond arrives to snoop. That is a trifecta of convenience and therefore deserves a trifecta of sense. Feels even better from where I'm sitting. Movie has time for this. Did you know I was an agent with orders to seduce you? Why do you think I sent you three dozen red roses? Ah, yes. As the famous poem goes, roses are red. Let me seduce you. My name is James Bond. You're a communist, aren't you? The bubbles tickle my... Tchaikovsky! Tickling someone's Tchaikovsky without explicit consent. Bond films can run together, but there's usually something that distinguishes them. For instance, Moonraker is the one where James Bond goes to space. Goldfinger is the one where they break into Fort Knox. And A View to a Kill is the one where James geriatrically f***s his way through the plot. Wait, they're in a spa and not a hotel room or cabin? I know James is horny, but this late at night, they're probably like the ninth couple to f*** in that hot tub today. I'd be looking at some tape of Nippon's hot tub cleaning procedures before sticking my Tchaikovsky in any part of that water. I really can't figure out what purpose General Gogol serves in this movie. The other time we've seen him, he was giving Zorn some lip for not being loyal to the KG or some such nonsense, but if Zorn doesn't need him, well, I'm not sure why the movie does. I guess in 1985, a spy movie without a Soviet general didn't make sense. Pola and the general have clearly never seen Diamonds Are Forever. If they had, they would know that one should never leave Bond unsupervised around cassettes. Also, who decided these looks of confusion were the way to go in this moment? This looks like a scene from a Seinfeld episode. <laughs> See, it works perfectly! Writing main strike as one word, unless he's referring to the 1990s Dutch-based punk rock band of the same name, which I'm 95% sure he's not. If you'd like any further information, just call me, Mr. Uh... Stock. James Stock. <sighs> Stalking. <laughs> this unnecessary jump scare cat that's associated change of underwear. And, of course, James shows up at Stacy's house, right, as she's about to have an attempt on her life made because reasons. Anthony Edwards' stunt double showed up on the wrong set this day, but John Glenn said, F*** it, we've only got an hour of daylight left, put the wig that looks nothing like Roger Moore's hair on him, and let's shoot this bitch. It's all right. It was Granddad's ashes. Leaving a presumably expensive vase containing your grandfather's ashes on this precarious pedestal is 100% asking for trouble. Especially with a cat in the house. They're great pets, but my God, do they love to watch the world burn. Quiche. They have it, Sounds interesting. Mmm. What is it? An omelette. There are a hundred reasons why this is not an omelette, but I will instead focus on the fact that rather than doing cool spy sh this movie presents us with James Bond baking a f***ing quiche. Also, the humble quiche, no matter how moist and delicious, is not the seductive delicacy that Bond evidently thinks it is. And screw you if you think his motivation for cooking this meal is anything other than a way to gain access to her souffle. Damn it! Am I hungry or horny? Horngry? That information is available at City Hall. I still have my security pass. I know the government cog can run slow, but they would have deactivated Stacy's security pass as soon as she was fired. Meanwhile, I'll contact Washington. Tell me we need more help out here. Well, don't waste any time. According to the tape, there's only 24 hours. Then why did you spend so much time quicheing? This is the second partner that Bond has lost in as many days to this exact method of assassination. Would a heads up have been too much to ask? Hey, I'm sure they teach you this on day one of CIA school, but don't forget to check the back seats for assassins. We know that's Mayday driving the car because we just saw her kill Chuck Lee. But why wouldn't she go ahead and kill Bond and Stacy while she's there? I guess that would just be silly. The first random file Bond looks in produces the important piece of paper they need. He really is a super spy. Alive and well, I see. Yay, more villains spouting about how Bond is still alive and then they'll just keep spouting instead of killing and holy shit, is that Luxo Jr.? All right, I have to ask, why the fuck is this movie so desperate to show us what this homeless guy thinks about this burning town hall situation? No one will be seated during the exciting climb down the fireman's ladder. Seriously, you're gonna waste some time score swelling on this? Also, why were no firemen using this ladder after they set it up? Why are they standing on the ground, staring, instead of trying to help the man with a full-grown woman across his shoulders climbing down? This poor woman is handed from man to man like a f***ing rag doll. Yes, she's inhaled a lot of smoke, but so is Bond. This has nothing to do with her current medical condition and everything to do with making sure our macho hero is able to swing his d*** around as much as possible. This is James Stock of the London Financial Times. I'm not sure why Stacy feels like this information will be helpful to Bond's case, and I'm also not sure why she still believes he's just a reporter. And I'm Dick Tracy and you're still under arrest. Would it not have been easier or quicker for Bond to agree to go down to the station and allow them to confirm his credentials? Anything to prevent what has now become a car chase through downtown San Francisco in a f***ing fire truck. Also, how have the police not immediately overtaken him? It's a fire truck! It weighs like a million tons and it corners like a f***ing fire truck! My real name is Bond. James Bond, you must take my word for it. Even though I've been lying to you this whole time and completely took advantage of your trust, but this time you should believe me. Could say she's feeling horny. Oh, f*** you, that's still better than 90% of the innuendo in this movie.
Really couldn't find a better place to pull over and have a pickup truck f than a side street in downtown San Francisco. What the f is this Keystone Cops bullshit? Where's the fire? On your rear end. This man runs straight to the back of his explosives carrying vehicle when he's told it's on fire instead of running as far away as his poor little henchman's feet will carry him. That's a good idea of yours. Pity you couldn't find one that fits. Making fun of how Tanya Roberts looks in anything is a sin. As clear of a view as Stacy and Bond have of Jenny Flex, her, and everyone else in this area should be able to see them very easily. I will never understand the point of these bomb countdowns. Any number of things could cause a delay that ruins the entire plan, and of course it always allows the hero to disarm, remove it at the last possible second. Why can't it be detonated remotely? If Zorin can inject a horse with a f***ing steroid boost remotely, why the hell can't he do the same with his bomb? You found anything? Yes. I think I have. These villains sure can't resist building huge dioramas that give away their entire plan to those trying to capture them. You'd think someone would tell them to cut that shit out by now. Lots of seepage. Could fight any minute. This was the seventh most common excuse my college girlfriend used to avoid having sex with me. Now which way? <sighs> the map. There's a drop from up there. Men no need map. Men have fire. But Mayday and my men. Yeah, a convenient coincidence. Sorn would be the main villain at Cinema Sins. Mr. Zorn, those men are loyal to you. Guess I won't be needing this anymore. I won't be alive! Oh, duty. The biggest problem I have with Zorn is a complete lack of bad guy nuance. And this nearly four minute long scene of him mowing down person after person with machine gun just sums it up. He says he's doing it so there aren't any witnesses, but it really just feels like a violently gratuitous yet predictably lazy way of getting the audience to hate him more. You know, just in case his plan to wipe out Silicon Valley and all of its inhabitants hadn't quite got us there. And I thought that creep loved me! Right? He loved you so much, he didn't even bat an eye when you went into Bond earlier. No, Bond, this highly athletic superhuman does not need your help swimming just because she is a woman. This movie and most Bond movies spend an unnecessary amount of time proving how manly Bond is, all too often at the expense of the female leads. Zorn clearly used the hey wouldn't it be cool if school of villain vehicle selection. Seriously, a f***ing blimp. Why? Stacy behind you! Get out! Yes, please be aware of that very slow moving, insanely difficult to maneuver, easily avoidable blimp that couldn't possibly wait they f***ing catch her? In a f***ing blimp? What the f***? James is able to hold onto this rope without any gloves or protection for as long as he does. Hurrah! I am overjoyed that we got one final shot of this incompetent cop. I would have been left forever wondering exactly how incompetent is this guy were it not for this final feckless fender bender. It's a trademark of the Bond franchise to visit a variety of locales around the world, but in this film it just feels gimmicky. We have a horse race, the Eiffel Tower, a country mansion, San Francisco Bay, a mine, and a f***ing blimp over the Golden Gate Bridge. All this without a single underlying theme connecting them beyond Bond's boner. There are at least two guns within grabbing distance and Zorin goes for the f***ing axe. <laughs> Why would he f***ing tell her to jump? Shimmy down maybe, but jump? <laughs> Who has it in case of emergency dynamite compartment on their f***ing blimp? Max! 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 Q's known Bond long enough at this point to know exactly what this clothing on the floor means, so he is definitely just being a pervert here. Are they gonna lay down in a shower? 